And so we get to the central limit theorem. Now, something magical and beautiful is going to happen right before your eyes. Now, imagine we've got a population of 10,000 individuals. And for some variable, we know the absolute value of all of those 10,000. I could take blood of all 10,000, say the human beings, I could take blood for all 10,000 of them, and I know for some blood result the exact value for all 10,000 of them. Now, imagine also that those values are completely random. They don't follow some pattern. Any person in that 10,000 can have for that blood result any value. But let's just, for argument's sake, just stick those values to be between 30 and 40, just for the graph that I'm going to show you. So all 10,000 of them are going to have different values between 30 and 40 for that blood result. Okay. Now, let's say we take 30 random samples, 30 random people, total random 10,000 standing in front of us, and we take 30 of them, and we're going to look at their results. We're going to calculate then the mean of those 30 results. Now imagine we can do that over and over and over and over again. Every time I'm going to draw 30 different ones. Now we saw in combinations just how many you can come up with choosing 6 from 47. Now imagine choosing 30 from 10,000. That would be an enormous number of different combinations of 30 people you could do. Take 30 people, get their values, calculate a mean. Now have a look at this. There's all our 10,000. Histogram there, we see their values were between 30 and 40, and we saw, we see uh, how many individuals fell into the different little categories there, from 30 to 31, 30, 32, etc. So a completely random, different spread, they could have any value. But now, what is going to happen if we start plotting all those means? So I take my 30 individuals, I calculate the mean, I've got a mean on the table, send them back, take another 30 at random. Now, you all know now there's going to be billions and billions and billions of combinations from those 10,000. And I could have, at random, drawn any 30 of them. And that's what happens in real research. We take 30 people at random. And that was just the mean for them, or the difference between the means of two groups, or three groups, or whatever. We just could have done so many 30 different, or 50 different, or 100 different. There would be so many different means we could work out. But imagine we did that for this 10,000, drawing 30, drawing 30, and doing their means, and we start placing them on the table, we start stacking them. Different means will occur more commonly than others. And here's the beauty. No matter how skew that original data was, no matter how skew an individual set of 30 was, if we could do all of those means, of all of those countless, 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 countless samples of 30, this is what it's going to look like. The distribution of those means is going to be beautifully, symmetrically bell-shaped. And that's why we can use statistics. And that's why we can use uh, the p-value, the geometrical area under a curve. Because if we stack up all the means, of all the possible means, it's going to look like this. And that is the central limit theorem. We can now say that the 30 we found from a study, or if we read a study in the literature, the 30 individuals in that study or 60 individuals in that study or the difference between the two groups is just one of countless possible others. And that's what the statistics does. It takes those values, uses some, um, uh, some of those values, and it draws that curve for you. The mathematics will take some representation, draw that curve for you, and your 30 or the 30 that you're reading about falls somewhere on a much larger set of possible values. And if the value that you found in your study should not have occurred very commonly, if in actual fact the probability of it was less than 0.05, we would term that significant because it would have been rare to find that specific result. And there you have it, the central limit theorem.